Our universe is filled with secrets and mysteries, leaving us with many questions to be answered. We find ourselves searching for those answers as the very fabric of space, science, and society are converging. Here for the first time, these worlds collide. Oh, what you? What do you think? This is Star Talk. I'm your host, Neil deGrasse Tyson, your personal astrophysicist. And I'm here in studio with Chuck Nice sitting across from me. Chuck Nice, comedian. How you doing, man? I'm doing very well. You know, I don't think I've ever seen you do stand-up. Oh, really? You gotta come sometime. Yeah, send me an invitation. Yeah, I, definitely. No, let me restate that. I don't think I've ever been invited to see Ooh. you stand-up. Stand <laughs> Snap. Damn. From what I hear, I'm very funny. That's, that is what people tell me all the time. You know, so... <laughs> so we've got another Cosmic Queries edition of Star Talk. Yes, this, this one. This is like fans and people like Cosmic Queries. You know, we. You know, I'd rather. You know, I prefer to be like interviewing guests and stuff. You know. Oh uh, well, thanks. No. no. <laughs> <laughs> so instead of be here, be like encyclopedia man for well, the universe, but. I think people enjoy the passion that you bring to uh, the answers of the questions. Okay. You know, it's right. like, I know your thing is to empower people to find information on their own or to steer them to other information. Yeah. I know that's what you like to as do. As an educator. As that's an what educator. I do. Yeah. But what I think people, you don't want to be the actual resource, like, you know. Exactly. Like my mom used to say, I was like, what's that mean? Go look it up. That's what she used to say. <laughs> But I think what people enjoy is the fact that you bring the information in a very entertaining and very passionate, fervent way. Okay. So right. that's what they really dig, not just the, the fact that you're giving the information. All right. Okay? All right. So let's do this. Let's do and this. And I haven't seen these questions at all. No, you have not. And these are and, from... And the category? No category. No, so this, this, is the, this is the leftovers. <laughs> right. Little hodgepodge. The po potpourri. The potpourri. The, okay. That's right. Cosmic Queries potpourri. And, and in math, we would call it random. Right. Yes, yeah, rather than poopery hodgepodge. Right. Random. Random. Okay, go. Cosmic queries, random. Uh, the random edition. Mm-hmm. Go. Okay. Uh, Kasim Johnson wants to know this from Facebook and Earth, because he doesn't tell me where on Earth he is from. Yeah, if you don't say, we're just going to say you're Earth. Right. Yeah, all right. Mm -hmm. He says, is it possible for a stable black hole to exist within a stable star? Ooh. Yeah. That's kind of a wild question. Uh, no. The black hole would eat the star. Ooh, from the inside out. Yeah. Oh, my God, that's amazing. Yeah, that'd be nasty, That too. would be ugly. Ugly, totally ugly. Uh, yeah. it's, it's like that, uh, the Asian, uh, drawing of a dragon eating itself. No, oh, or its tail. Or its tail, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, no, there you mm -hmm. have it. Good question. Yeah, and by the way, the center of a star is where it's at its hottest, which is the source of the generation of energy. So mm -hmm. if your center became a black hole, you're not generating any er energy for the star anymore. Right. And that's all she wrote. And that's it. So mm -hmm. the star would just get sucked yeah. right up. Yep, yep. Okay. Balance. Wait, wait, wait. Now you have to do, you do your imitation of the supermassive black hole after just ate something. Uh, no, no, no. It was, was that it? No? No, that wasn't it. Okay. That was, <laughs> <laughs> that's the middle school version of it, right? Right, right. right. No, no, it was the um, the black hole... Uh, eating any star that comes nearby, and you say, <laughs> it was just a oh, fat no, black no, hole. Oh, yeah, it's a fat black hole. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was delicious. <laughs> I believe I just had a cosmic snack. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> it's the fat black hole. <laughs> I, I believe that was delicious. <laughs> Mm. Yeah, so black hole, yeah, it would eat the star from within. It would within. eat the star right. from within. And thank you for the personification of the exactly. black hole. I can't believe I just ate myself. <laughs> All right, Thomas Valenzuela. Mm -hmm. All right, so uh, does the rotation of the galaxies give us north and south orientation in the universe? Based on something similar to the uh, Coriolis effect, and if that is the case... Could it be used as a reference to measure distances and our position versus the equator of the universe? No. Okay, next question. <laughs> <laughs> no, there's, a, there's some interesting backstory here. Yes. So in physics, we have an unambiguous way of how to define what is north. Really? Yes. Okay, okay please. So north has meaning only in things that rotate. Okay. All right. right. 
if I, if I put a book in front of you and say, what's north? It, it, it means make, nothing. It means nothing. Okay. Right. Rotate something. Now, take your right hand, curl your fingers in the direction the thing is rotating. Okay. Then stick up your thumb. Mm-hmm. That's north. Got you. Okay. Got you. And so that's how we can say if something is rotating upside down. Right. Relative to north, because you'd have to twist your twist hand your upside, upside down, down, curl it. Curl the fingers, and now it's rotating in that direction. Now your thumb is pointing your down. It's pointing down. Okay. So that's how we define rotation. We did not know that the galaxy was a rotating thing until long after we had, like, named it. Right. You know, why is it called galaxy? Get Galactos is Greek for milk. That's the Milky Way right. going across the night sky. Because it just looked like a streak of white across a, a streak the of white. blackened night sky. Ex not, they didn't think it was literally milk, but right. it was the poetic reference to it, right? right? And so, so that's the galaxy. And it, now, if you learn that it is a flattened system, mm -hmm. and then you want to ask, does it have a north and a south? We astronomers in the early day assigned the north pole of the galaxy to the pole of the galaxy that happened to be in the northern hemisphere of the Earth, of oh, Earth's sky. Gotcha. All right. Because we're seeing it from the north or top part For of, top what, part. of so our reference. Of our reference. We would later learn which way the galaxy was rotating, and it turns out it's turning the other way. Gotcha. So we are stuck calling the north pole of the galaxy the opposite of what our laws that we made for ourselves to define it as such would give us. Gotcha. Yeah, so in other words, what we say is the north pole of the galaxy is in the northern hemisphere sky, but it's actually the, the south, south pole of the galaxy. Of the galaxy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yes, we can orient the galaxy, but we the, the universe, we've never found a way to orient it. There's no patch of material in one direction or another, an axis, a right. distribution, a right. plane, right. none of that. The stuff is, like, pretty random as far out as you go. That's cool, man. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so we could do that here on Earth because we have all of those things yeah. to measure and yeah. look at. There's the North Pole of the solar system. Which right. way is all, are all the planets exactly. turning around the sun? Because we see the sun as a center. Yeah, which way is the sun rotating? So that sun right. has a North Pole. Everybody's right. got a North Pole. Gotcha. Yeah. That is cool. And that's because we didn't know it was... We didn't know it was rotating. We, we had to discover the galaxy because we're in it. And right. Very, it's like, how do you know what your mother looks like if you're in, an embryo within her womb? That's so funny. You don't know. So no, one don't. of the last things we discovered was the galaxy, what, what the hell we look like in the galaxy. What a great, uh, yeah. what a, what a great example. How do you know what your mom looks like before you're born? Yeah, you have no idea. Right. You, you know her voice. Unless you get a selfie stick and put it out <laughs> <laughs> oh, Jesus! God. What? I'm just that there could be a way to do it. That's awesome. That's all I'm saying. Oh my God! <laughs> Selfie stick. Okay, let's move on to Alex Perkins. Okay. <laughs> Alex is uh, coming to us from Earth, and Alex says, um, "Hey, I just turned thirty. Uh, hey, happy birthday, man! Uh, how feasible is it in my lifetime to see people land on Europa?" Now, I, I suppose he's singing, using uh, the average lifespan because we don't know. Alex could be hit by a bus next week. You know, that's not... What? 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 <laughs> <laughs> I don't think that's the life expectancy he's planning for this question. Okay, you're right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. okay, Alex, if you're going to hit by a bus next week, you ain't never seeing this happen, all right? <laughs> uh, so. So in the average lifespan now... I'd like to believe that before Alex turns 100, okay, this is the positive outlook, yes, Alex, yes. <laughs> uh, that we might be able to send people to Europa. That would just be very cool. That would happen only the day we are, like the solar system is our backyard. It, that w I don't see that as a destination itself. I see that as just one of the many things we're doing in space. Right. Visiting Europa. And it'd be very cool. I, I talk about going to Europa all the time. Yeah. Go ice fishing on Europa. It's an outer icy layer, layer of ice. And uh, stress from Jupiter's gravity heats Europa. By the way, Europa and Jupiter are outside of the Goldilocks zone. Right. So if you're outside of it, your water is, is evaporated because you're too close. Or you're frozen because you're too far away. Right. Jupiter pumps energy into Europa because of its gravity and has melted the ice beneath the surface. So we got a, it's like an M&M, &M, it's an M&M &M moon. It's got a hard candy outside. A hard and candy. A, yes, and it's, it's soft a nice and squishy. nice watery, squishy inside. So you're out there and I want to go, like I've said this many times, I want to go ice fishing on Europa. There's a movie called The Europa Report which is about the man man's first mission to Europa. Nice. And so and they and 
they want to look for life there. So, yeah, I, I think that could happen definitely in his lifetime. Well, with all those oceans underneath Europa, how likely is the, uh, the possibility of life? Because Well, water and life go together yeah. hand in hand here on Earth. And, and I, I, I've said this before. Uh, there's, there's life every place on Earth where there's water, liquid right. water, even the Dead Sea. Correct. Now, why is there life in the Dead Sea? Why is it called the Dead Sea? Because they, uh, okay, there are no macroscopic fishes swimming around. But at the time they named it the Dead Sea, you know what they didn't have? No. A microscope. A microscope. <laughs> right. <laughs> there you go. So there you have it. Right. So they're defining their world by what their senses tell them, when in fact what science is all about is extending your senses and creating new ways of detection that your biological form can't even approximate. And then you deduce the nature of the world. Gotcha. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah. All right. Great question, Alex. And I uh, hope you live to be 100, buddy. Okay? <laughs> okay. All right. James Claver wants to know this. Uh, he's from Bangor, Michigan. He says, I've been reading your book, Death by Black Hole. Oh, thank you. Mm -hmm. It's a fan favorite book, yeah. Death by Black Hole. And you mentioned that scientists knew there were holes in the periodic table well before they were discovered. I'm just wondering, how did they know? Maybe a brief history of how they were originally organized. So we know these tables. We know that there's gaps. How do they know there's gaps? Yeah, so I, I'd love me some periodic table. Mm -hmm. Just I, I can't get enough periodic table, just so you know. Gotcha. So, so, so once you learn how to organize the elements, which is what um, uh, Mendeleev figured out, okay. a Russian scientist, right? right? Uh, he... Once you do that, if you arrange them by how many protons are in their nucleus, very simple way to, okay, That's how many protons? Simple, right. Just how many count, protons count you got? Protons. You got four, then you're over here. You got five, go next to four. You got seven, skip one. Do we have six yet? No, not, well, actually, we did have six. Six is carbon. But um, do we have eight? Oh, that, that's oxygen. Right? Give me a hard one. Do you have nine? Right. If, and if no, we don't have it yet, but we got ten. So ten go in your ten slot. Right. Well, who's where's nine? We don't have it yet. Well, get get off your ass and find me some nine. Gotcha. And so this th these are how we you establish the gaps in the periodic table. The periodic table is complete from one up to one hundred and what are we up to one hundred and ten or twelve or something. So it's not like you're going to discover some other element that's going to pry right, itself. That's gonna, right, because there's no nine point seven. There's no nine point seven. Correct. Correct. That's okay. why it's complete. Gotcha. Yeah, yeah. There were, it, some some aspects of science are complete. Just gotcha. We, that's how it is. That's why it's a beautiful thing, and it's a record of discovery over the centuries. Mm -hmm. And I, I love it. So now, for, for example, the element uh, we we discovered an element on the sun before we discovered it here on Earth. Okay. And we named it after the sun. The sun god, Helios. Helium. Which became helium. Which is mm, a lot of that in the sun. Uh, yeah, it's like ten per, about 10% of yeah. it's made of helium. Yeah. And we're running out of it on Earth. On Earth, that's right. That's right. And so helium is not uncommon in the universe. And because we keep filling, like, Thanksgiving Day balloons with helium. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, in the old days, they would let it escape right. and then regenerate the helium. But uh, now they recapture it, I've, I've been told. after Okay. Because Macy's is the second biggest consumer of helium in the world. Get out of yeah, here. After the U.S. military. And uh, yeah, Helium has very special properties, not all of which I can divulge. Get out. Really? Yeah. Come on. Yeah. Oh, like making you talk funny? Because that's, <laughs> that's, that happens that's too. the best Not one. a secret. Not a secret. Oh, okay. Because yeah. <laughs> that's the best one, by the mm -hmm. way. Mm -hmm. All right. Great stuff, man. So there you have it. A periodic. So now that, okay. Uh, that's how you know you have a missing element. That's what I say. Mm -hmm. So now, now, now. Oh, wait, wait. Let's take it one step further. Go ahead. There's an element that was missing. And we did the calculation after quantum physics was discovered. And we noticed that that element is unstable. So even if it was ever in the universe, it would have decayed into something right. else by now. Yes. So it would be like a permanent gap. Gotcha. Ne anything that was there was not there now. So right. we said, well, okay, let's just make it, make the stuff. So we manufactured an element to fit in the gap. And we named it after ourselves. We named it after technology. It's called technetium. Technetium. Yeah. Sweet. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. man. And, of course, because we made it, it can't last. <laughs> Plus, we named it tech. I mean, yeah, tech, means, tech means, like, means artificial. Yeah. And, in fact, technetium is a, is a very active uh, tool, potent tool for the radiologist. Because you you can set it up in ways that have different half-lives. Gotcha. Uh, six hours or ten hours. Uh -huh. And you can do experiments with, you know, your, your, your circulatory system uh, by tracking the radioactivity. And if small amounts are okay, if it can... Right. 
the, and you can the, trace it as it moves. As, as it moves. And the half-life, it, it, it'll go away and, and it, you don't and have to worry you're about done. it. You're done. You leave the hospital, you're done. Right. Yeah. That is brilliant. I was once in a hospital with one of my radiation detectors, which I occasionally carry, and... Only you would make someone, this <laughs> someone sat down next to me <laughs> in the waiting room, and the, the alarm started going off. And I looked to the person. I said, "Okay, what what are you in for?" Right. Well, they just did a they just did a radioactive dye test on right. him, and he was still radioactive for, as he would be for the next few hours. So I, I so I moved to another chair. <laughs> <laughs> wow! All right. Um, okay, so we got yeah, we got uh, one more. We one, got more. one more before we break. All right. This is from Rob Z. What do you think the bright spot on Ceres is? Oh, Ceres. Ceres. Uh, yeah, so the, the largest asteroid is actually has enough gravity to turn it into a round shape. So it's the only round asteroid. So Technically, it, we shouldn't even call it an asteroid. Is it a, a, what, would a dwarf planet then? Precisely. No. Chuck. Oh, I've been hanging around you too oh. long. Oh, I've been Chuck hanging around you too it. long. So objects that are that are just big enough to be turned into a sphere by their own gravity, right. but they haven't cleared their orbit because Ceres is orbiting in the asteroid belt. Dwarf planet. Right. Pluto, okay. big enough to be a sphere, but it's orbiting in the Kuiper belt. Dwarf planet. There That's you go. It. So a bright spot on Ceres? I, I have no idea. <laughs> 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 I can tell you other stuff about Ceres. It was the first asteroid discovered back in 1800 or 1801. Right. And so obviously you're going to discover the biggest, brightest one first. Right. Because you know, that makes sense. And so they wanted to, they thought they discovered a planet. And so they want, and planets are named after Roman gods. God, and so they named it after um, a Roman the Roman goddess of harvest. And mm -hmm. Ceres, that's the root of the word cereal. Right. Mm, whole grain oats. <laughs> that's, right. mm, that's, deli that's a delicious planet. So that's, or dwarf planet. <laughs> so that's Ceres. There's so Ceres. Uh, I'm guessing it's a highly reflective icy area right. of, it, of the object because ice can be very reflective relative to any other kind of rock. Gotcha. And it doesn't take much to be more reflective than rock to show up blazingly in images you take of an object. Gotcha. So that's my guess. Yeah. Well, there you go, Rob. Get sure. yourself a bowl and a spoon and enjoy some <laughs> series. <laughs> so we uh, we got to take a break, Chuck. Yes. But when we come back, more Cosmic Queries, Popery Edition. All that is random in the quizzical universe. The way to a person's heart is through their stomach, but not all ingredients are created equal. Fresh, high-quality ingredients make for better-tasting meals. You know it's true. And guess what I had the other night for dinner? I had seared salmon and sauce gribiche with potatoes, summer beans, and cherry toms. I didn't make it. My wife did. I got to tell you something. My wife can't cook. She's awful at it. I'm sorry, baby. It's the truth. But it was delicious. Do you know why? Because Blue Apron delivered it right to our door. And it was so easy because everything was pre-portioned and laid out for her and it ended up being delicious. And not only do they deliver delicious meals right to your door, they have established partnerships with over 150 local farms, fisheries, and ranchers across the United States. So seafood is sourced sustainably under standards developed in partnership with Monterey Bay Aquarium Seafood Watch. Beef is raised humanely. Chickens are free range and pork is raised naturally. Blue Apron can be delivered to 99% of the continental U.S. and and the foods are just delicious. Oh, and did I mention that it comes out to less than $10 a meal? So here's what you need to do. Check out this week's menu and get your first three meals free with free shipping by going to blueapron.com slash startalk. That's right. Your first three meals free with free shipping. What do I have to do? Eat this for you? BlueApron.com slash StarTalk. Blue Apron, a better way to cook. Bringing space and science down to earth. You're listening to StarTalk. Seems like this is it, like this is all there is. Big goodbye, I'm playing tickets, see how the rest of us live. You know, the world keeps on spinning while I'm spinning this first. Yeah, we show love to the world. You're my honey, honey, hop the first. 
back on Star Talk. Tyson here, Chuck Nice there. That's right. Yeah, man. We're, we're popurying together. Yes, we are. <laughs> <laughs> and we're yes, we are. <laughs> and we're smelling good. Um, yeah. We're popurying together. Popurying, and asking me questions uh, dr- uh, drawn from our our loyal fan base. Yes. And you, you haven't asked me a really crazy, stupid question yet. And you know, there's got to be some in every batch. Oh, God, You're asking me yes. very intelligent questions, but some of the weird ones get there are some interesting answers to them. I'm just saying. Yeah. You're, you're choosing. I don't know anything. You you compiled this. All right. Well, I'm guess just what? letting since, you know. Since you said it. Uh, okay. And, and maybe I'll change my mind after this. I don't know because guess what? <laughs> I skipped over this question okay. in that first segment, and as you saw me just take pick this page back up. Yes, you picked that the page was, back I, up. That I, was I, in the trash. It was yeah. in the. I turned that over. I'm gonna pick it back up because here it is. Oh, it's from. Uh, Inti Amartusa. I know. Uh, Amartusa. Okay. Ama- okay, that's it. Yeah. Whatever you say. <laughs> <laughs> you uh, know what I think? I think you actually have no friends ever in your life. So you never had any practice pronouncing other people's names. Well, you got one part of that right. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, Inti Amatur. Uh, okay, forget it. If you had superpowers, would you wear spandex? <laughs> okay, so if you were a superhero, would you go with the spandex? Uh, if maybe if I had a cut body, and then the spandex will show off the body, that could help intimidate crim- criminals. You know, right? Maybe. Uh, I'm just thinking. I mean, see, I wouldn't. I would go with a three piece suit. Because <laughs> then I'd show up and they think I was just a banker, and then all of a sudden I'm like. Blowing stuff up with my eyes and <laughs> throwing guys across the room. You want to be like Kingsman? Yes. You want to just walk around yeah. with a dapper, right. you know, umbrella yeah. and a and a cane. And every time I shout, they'd be like, "Who is this guy? <laughs> Who is this banker that keeps showing up and kicking our ass?" <laughs> yeah. That's good. I like the banker model. I, I like that. Now, yeah, no, you're right. Why have spandex? Yeah, no, exactly. No, there's no. Uh, you know, and I think in the early days, Superman was wearing pantyhose, you know, so. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah, blue pantyhose. Yeah. So, yeah, th- uh, there's no call for that. Yeah. Uh, you're right. All right, cool. All right, uh, 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 banker, three-piece suit. Three-piece suit, All man. Right. Mm-hmm. Sweet. All right, let me put that back over You here. know what I would do? And I would draw from my supply of ties, and each tie would have a separate, different superpower that it, it gave me. Now, that's kind of cool. And if you saw my tie, you, you, know, you, what, you know, know what you're dealing how with. I, how I was going to kick your ass that day. <laughs> <laughs> I like that it. stuff will get telegraphed. There we yeah. go. Okay. All yeah. right, there you go. So thank you, Inti. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. All right, here we go. Mm-hmm. Uh, this is from Nelson Sa. Mm-hmm. Nelson says, uh, what are some of the most important non-space-related advances which came directly or mostly from research at NASA. Oh, so, well, of you course, know, NASA is fully focused on space. So uh, maybe the way to answer this is there are advances that directly helped space and the things we were doing in space and other things that not only helped space, but then helped what we did here on Earth. Okay. Maybe that's the way to answer this. Because right. NASA's not researching how to make your better cup of coffee. But they do utilize technology and technological advances. It is always with the mission of trying to improve our duration, time, technology, and space. Mm-hmm. But that doesn't mean it can't apply to very cool things on Earth. For example. Go ahead. Something simple. You ready? Go ahead. Uh, lately, if you have taken the exit ramp over of most uh, highways, and if that exit ramp has a pretty tight turn, the pavement is grooved. It is. Have you noticed that? I have noticed that. Okay, that came from NASA. And why exactly would that come from NASA? <laughs> because, because the last time I checked space, <laughs> there were no off ramps. <laughs> so I'm just a little okay. curious. Uh, okay, as I understood this when it was told to me, the uh, you have the space shuttle coming in for a landing, and it's not the space shuttle is a glider coming right, in. All right? right, this is back when we actually put people in space. Right? How sad. Okay, so but in the day, way back. Right. I Bill, remember when. <laughs> as Bill Nye likes to do, he he's always puts on his old man voice right. when he's talking. Way back in the day, um, you go back, and when we flew space shuttles, when you come back to Earth and you're going to land, you are landing a glider. Right. All right. There's hardly any control over your, you know, you have heirloom flaps and things, but you're a glider. Now, suppose it's raining or there's, it's a little wet. 
okay? Mm. You don't want the thing sliding to the left and the right. So you put grooves in the pavement, which help align the wheels in the direction the wheel is rotating, which is the direction the road points. Right. There you have it. And so this reduced the possibility of skidding, and people realized, hey, why don't we put that on off-ramps? Because if you're going too fast and you come off the ramp, you're hitting the embankment. Right. Okay, so now you can ask, here's the, here's the fascinating point. You can say, why spend the millions of dollars or whatever it took to a good, why not just have somebody invent that outright? Why? Yeah. Okay, because... No one did. <laughs> I mean, this, this, however cheap you think that is, right. the fact is that solution only came about when someone cared about space. Right. And it turns out when you going, I have found, you go into space, people gather around who care about that. Right. Smart people who care about that. Right. And those are the problems they want to solve. You're not going to go to the smartest person in the room and say, oh, couldn't you help me prevent cars from skidding off the off-ramp of the uh, Interstate 95? Well, see, there's also no money in that, what you, that last point. Right. Well, yeah. It, it, hey, help me stop cars from skidding off the, <laughs> yeah, well, what's in it for me? <laughs> right, right. And what, Why and, should I help you do that? And I'm at the top of my class. Why right. am I going to do that? But if I instead say prevent the space shuttle after coming out of orbit from skidding on its runway, you're going to figure this stuff out. Right. So space exploration has a way of infusing levels and dimensions of creativity in anybody who thinks about it. Mm -hmm. and, and that's how you get these amazing solutions to everyday life. Oh, man, that is a great, great point. And I'm not even calling them spinoffs, because a spinoff would be we got this widget in space, now you use the widget on Earth. No. It's not even about that. No, no. Yeah. These are, I mean, some of these are direct applications just because they, as you, fi as, as you see with the grooves, you find use for it somewhere else, and it's extremely important to have. I, you can't think of how many thousands of lives probably have been saved by people having grooves. That, that simple little thing. That's that, simple. And that's, no one writes a story about the life that was not taken. So true. Yeah. Hey, well, that was a great question, mm -hmm. Nelson. And uh, just remember that uh, NASA will continue to uh, suffer budget cuts. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> just figured I'd throw that in. <laughs> Just, just say. Oh wait, wait. Let me give you one more. Just one more example. Okay. So the docking uh, algorithms to get the space shuttle to right. dock with the space station. Right. There are two sort of collars that come together. Right. And there's a laser stabilizing system that enables that to happen. Right. And there's software related to that and the like. I say right as in I'm sure you're right. <laughs> I'm not saying right as in yes, you're correct yeah, because I, I already knew that. Right. Exactly. But so, go ahead. so what we found is that. The surgery used to cut your cornea, have it rehealed to adjust your vision. Which we call correct. LASIK. LASIK surgery. Uh, well, we didn't always use lasers. Okay. That's A. True. B. So, uh, so now that it uses lasers, how do you do that to someone if their eye might jiggle a little bit while you're trying to cut? Right, because okay. that's not what you want. That's two not what you, you don't want. want. Two jiggling. things you want. Jiggle eye and, jiggle eye and, 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 and a cutting and, and edge. And a circumcision. Right. Okay. No. So, so what they've done was adapted this laser stabilizing mechanism that allowed the cut to move with the moving eyeball in case the moving eyeball moved. And it's from the docking mechanism of the space shuttle and the space station. That's so, right. so this NASA technology enabled this laser, LASIK surgery to be conducted safer and more cheaply than ever before. Yeah. That's why all of a sudden everybody started getting it. Absolutely. It's because, of, it's because it came out of space. Ah, oh, that's amazing. Not the concept for the surgery. No. But just the... The concept able... from the surgery came from an accident that a guy had and <laughs> cut his eye. No, honestly, he cut his eye and it healed and he was like, oh, okay, I don't know why, but I can see better, you know. Uh, but yeah, let's, 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 yeah, I can imagine. Let me try it on you. you know? <laughs> exactly. She chases you with the kitchen knife. Yeah, I can see better because I cut my eye. I should try to cut your eye. I bet you I could heal you. But uh, that's that's fantastic. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So that's an example of. Uh, so two extremes of examples: one where uh, uh, vision has been improved; the right. other, your driving has been improved. Okay. Yeah, right, and they, both of them came out of the space program. Yes, yes. and it happens all the time. That's amazing. Yeah. That's a hey, Nelson. Great question, mm -hmm. man. All right, this is from Scott, and that's all he says is, "This is from Scott." <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Okay, uh, he says, "On your premiere of Cosmos, you mentioned that the moon was pushed away by tidal friction. Can you explain that a little bit further? 
I had never heard it put like that before. Yep, yeah, uh, pushed is a very visual uh, uh, image, but what's really happening is that it's getting flung. Flung is a more sort of uh, physically accurate thing. Right. So what's going on is the moon creates a tidal bulge on Earth. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and so it, it, the water that's nearest the moon pulls towards the moon. The moon is pulling on Earth a little less, and the water that's on the other side of the moon is pulling on even less. So all the oceanic waters form this bulge. That f it's in a direct line to the moon, okay? Okay. All right. It turns out it's not in a direct line to the moon. Because Earth is rotating, oh. and we're rotating faster than the moon is turning around it. So we actually drag this bulge ahead of the moon. Okay. Okay? Okay. So this bulge right. is actually trying to slow us down. That's why we occasionally add leap seconds to the calendar. Gotcha. And because the bulge is ahead of the moon, right. the moon feels a gravitational force ahead of it. And so it wants to go faster in its orbit. Right. And by going faster in its orbit, it ascends to higher distances from Earth. Gotcha. So it's a, it's a, it's a cosmic it's... ballet choreographed by the forces of gravity. Gosh darn it. That was fantastic. So the, the moon is spiraling away about five inches a year from Earth just because of this flinging effect right. of the leading edge of this tidal bulge. Right. Oh, my. That is fantastic. Fascinating, because it's like the Earth is a container holding this water. Yes, yes, correct. But, so instead of lining up with the with the with the gravitational pull from of, the, of moon, the moon, right? Because the Earth is a container holding this water mm -hmm. and it's spinning. Yes, the water wants to move ahead. Yeah, we're, we're dragging we're the water dragging ahead of the, the moon. water ahead of the moon, and that costs us our rotational energy to do so. That God. Wait, wait. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, that's that's incredible! Well, I'm, it's just it's physics. I know, but I you know I don't do that a lot. No, no, <laughs> I, no don't do, you don't you, I don't do physics a lot. Uh, no, no, you you know you you look like at that moment you look like a double rainbow guy. You remember <laughs> double rainbow guy? He, he comes around the corner of the mountain. It's on YouTube. Right, like, right. Oh, 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 two rainbows. Oh, 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 and he starts crying. Exactly. I say, dude, it's physics. Okay, <laughs> chill out. <laughs> <laughs> oh my uh, gosh, this is divine. No, it's like it's light, yeah. all right? So, so I don't mean to take away the beauty of this. By the way, there are other things that are mysteries that we don't understand right. that are even more beautiful. Mm -hmm. But I'm saying... We, like women. We, we are in this tango with the moon. Right. Ultimately, if the, when the moon wins... Well, it's not going to win. Ultimately, the moon wants to slow us down so much that we rotate at exactly the same rate that the moon mm -hmm. orbits us. Right. And when that's the case, our tidal bulge will align. We will not be fighting the bulge, and the bulge will not be flinging the moon forward. And the system will be called will, will be in what is called a double tidal lock. Double tidal lock. Yeah, which was a wrestling Sounds move. Like a, I was, <laughs> I, I was going to say I wanted to invent the, that move. <laughs> what I used to wrestle. The double tidal. I wrestle, and I know astrophysics. You know, I was trying to invent a double tidal lock wrestling hold, right? Yeah. So, so what? So what happened at that point? Earth's day will equal the lunar month. Gotcha. And one side of the Earth will only ever face the moon. Just as today, one side of the moon only ever faces the Earth. Which is why there is never Earth rise on the moon. Right. It's always in the sky always if you're on that half of the moon. Gotcha. Yeah. That's awesome. Which is why that famous photo called Earth Rise, taken by Apollo 8 in December 1968, mm -hmm. it's called Earth Rise. Because the Earth was rising over the moon. Why? Well, it's because they were orbiting. Oh, or, right. They were orbiting the moon. Exactly. And they tip all up the camera, and there's Earth rising. That's how you get Earth rise. But people thought, oh, Earth rises on the moon, just like the moon rises on Earth. Not. No. Right. That's right. amazing. Not until the moon wins. Unfortunately, I'm still stuck on double tidal lock, and I'm trying to figure <laughs> out, like, do you put your, like, legs around the person's neck, and then you're, like, hanging off of their back, and then you grab both their knees... <laughs> And then you like whip it, and you know I got no. I, I, I I'll show you off camera. I'll show you. <laughs> I never perfected it, but I had I had the ideas of one. It that's was a, good. That's pretty cool. Mm -hmm. All right, that because what happens is you face your opponent, and then you, I swing you till you're out of balance, and then take you down while I'm still facing you. Because in a double tidal lock, both sides of the orbs are facing, facing one another, another, no matter what they do. So the idea is to get the person still facing you, and then as I swing, as you and swing take them down, into, right. Yeah. Yeah, that's fantastic. Maybe get a quick one in before the break. All right. Okay, go. All right, here's a good one, man. Yeah. Will this guy look different 
if we are all standing on another planet, constellations and such. So if I'm if I'm on another planet in this solar system, mm -hmm. do I see the same sky? Yes. What? You That's, heard what I said? You said yes. You, well, yeah. So here's, it's a simple answer, okay? So the extent of our solar system is like from, like, the sun to Neptune. Mm-hmm. Get over it. Okay. <laughs> no, if yeah. you look at the planets, so, so so it's this. So basically, we're such a small little exactly, part. Exactly. Exactly. We're so, not going to change the frame of reference. Exactly. So if you look at the width of the solar system, it's like ten light hours across. Okay. It would take a beam of light ten hours to cross the solar system. That's big. That's a long time, especially right. going with the speed of light. Right. However, as you look at the nearest stars, the stars that comprise the constellations, they are hundreds of light years away. Gotcha. So if you just shift your head 10 light hours, who, you know, the stars yeah, don't mean nothing. Right. They don't mean a damn thing to the stars. <laughs> so you got to start moving among the stars to change your perspective on the constellations for them to take on other shapes. Nice. And, and drag all the astrologers with you as they right. try to keep up with the new shapes. Right, okay? exactly. And tell you how the universe will now affect you right. because of the random stars oriented in the galaxy. Jack, we got to take a break. Okay. Uh, we'll come back and continue. You got more questions for me? Yes, I do. When Star Talk continues, more from Cosmic Bird. Can feel the roof crash down. Introducing New Synergy Gasoline, Exxon and Mobil's most tested fuel ever. It's been through and passed some of the most stringent tests ever developed. Developed in the same Exxon Mobil research lab as their F1 fuels, New Synergy Gasoline is engineered by chemists who understand the science behind keeping engines clean and know the complexities of modern car technology. That's why it's formulated to keep modern fuel injectors clean while still working great on older engines. New Synergy is also engineered with seven key ingredients, each with their own unique function to help make Synergy Exxon and Mobil's best fuel ever, including dual detergents to help clean your engine and corrosion inhibitor designed to help prevent rust from threatening your engine and its performance. Refuel with new Synergy gasoline today, only available at the almost 11,000 Exxon and Mobil stations across the U.S. Energy lives here. Visit exxon.com or mobil.com for more information. This is Star Talk. Everything you know is wrong. Black is white, up is down, and short is long. And everything you thought was just so important doesn't. Chuck, we're back. Yes. And this is Cosmic Queries, uh, Star Talk Radio. Cosmic Queries edition. And any more weird questions? I mean, weird questions have sometimes interesting answers. If you found this any. is true. Um, um, what do you got? Okay, okay. Uh, here's one from Jonathan Smith. From Las Vegas, Nevada. And you can pronounce his name. Uh, you know what? That's so true. <laughs> I'm going to give you a little gold star each time. Uh, yeah, <laughs> well, you know, I, I don't think I can really uh, be proud of Jonathan Smith. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Neil. Yeah. I've heard that the strongest evidence for gravity waves is the spiraling together of two neutron stars Good. as the ripples. Yes. Yes. Okay. However, neutron stars have incredibly strong magnetic pull as well. Indeed. Is it possible that the same dynamo effect that causes our sun to slow its rotation could be causing neutron stars to lose their combined angular momentum over time? No. Ooh. Okay, I'll tell you why. Go ahead. Because we can look at the ripples that neutron stars send out as they as they draw near one another, mm -hmm. and you calculate using Einstein's general theory of relativity, at what rate would it lose orbital energy to gravitational waves? Okay. And you write down that number. And then you look, we have binary neutron stars in our galaxy, and they are losing energy at exactly that rate. There's no unaccounted for need to then say, here's some other mechanism. It's not even necessary. It works exactly. We know where the energy is. We know where it came from and where, where it's, it's going. going. Yeah, right. exactly. So, But great you. question. That is a very and good question. And it's how you, how you make these deductions in the universe. You look at something you know very well. If it accounts for everything, there's no need to keep... You could keep looking, but why? I mean, right. Yeah. I mean, maybe it's sharing the cause, but... Everything I know about how I've accounted for it works. Right. So, so there's no need to. You're done right. and move on to the next problem. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. Exactly. There mm -hmm. you go. Mm -hmm. All right. So Jesse from Vancouver, Canada would like to know this. Um, 
Given that there is an upper limit or upper speed limit to the universe, being the speed of light, and a lower speed. It's not just a good idea. It's the law. (laughs) (laughs) Buckle up, galaxies. (laughs) Exactly. (laughs) You never know. (laughs) Okay. Um, And there's a lower speed limit. Oh, oh, by the way, the buckling up, uh, you only buckle up because the car... Your car changes speed, right? Not because it exists it, at any one speed at all. Well, it's the change that's the, pretty the change is what will kill you. Yeah, right. That's why you can be in an airplane going six hundred miles an hour at thirty nine thousand feet, and they say you may now unbuckle your seatbelt. Right, because <laughs> nothing's going to happen. <laughs> right. If it's, if you maintain your speed, that's not a problem. Yeah. It's if your speed changes, and that's what your seatbelt is for. Okay, right, so uh, yeah. given there's a lower speed limit, which is the absolute zero temperature, mm-hmm. could velocity be considered a dimension like space? Length, width, and depth. Uh, you have to ask, where, where, where are you going to go with that? What are you going to do with that? Mm-hmm. Because, for example, I, you can have a speed, and then I can slow you down with brakes. Right. Did you change dimension? I mean, where, no, where, where right. are you getting with that? Why? Yeah, uh, what is the purpose of even having... Have thinking about it that way. Right. If you want to... Uh, by the way, creative thinking is highly a good thing. In this world. Okay. But if you do so, ask yourself, is there something you will now be able to explain that you couldn't before? Gotcha. Because everything we've constructed about velocity and speed and all of this, it's, as Einstein said, uh, or was it uh, his protege, uh, said space tells matter how to move and matter tells space how to curve. Wow. Yeah, it's deep. That's a great one. Yeah, it's great. It's deep. So um, in that sense, it's not your speed, but... It's the gravity that's creating the dimensionality of the fabric of space, and you can move within that. So we move within the fabric of space. So right. the velocity itself is not, there's no cause to think about it that way. That's gotcha. all. Gotcha. So but uh, I, I applaud the exercise. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. It's mm-hmm. very creative thinking. Mm-hmm. And your answer, Jesse, is dark matter. <laughs> I'm just saying. I, I just will never that. answer one question with something else we don't know anything exactly. about. Exactly. Right? <laughs> See, that's how I do it. No, people do. <laughs> right. people, people say, oh, can we explain this thing in terms of consciousness? We don't know what consciousness is, right. so just back up. Right. Right? Give right. it space. That's funny. Mm-hmm. Uh, but see, you know what? That's a that's a great little cheat, though. It is a cheat. It's a great cheat. It's a complete cheat. Yeah. People do it all the time. Yeah, it mm-hmm. makes I mean, listen, because I, I don't know about this. Well, why don't we think about it in terms of something else we don't know about? <laughs> exactly. That'll answer because it. Because that'll answer it, right? <laughs> that, that's very funny. Right. <laughs> all right. This is from Amanda Milligan. Mm-hmm. And she says, in every documentary... And where's she from? She's from Earth? She is from Earth. Okay. She's just from Earth. Uh, in every documentary I have seen lately, extraterrestrial life is animal. How do you think plant life would evolve outside of our own world? Or could there be life that exists that could not be classified as either plant nor animal, there's, but still life? There's a famous science fiction story, and forgive me, for I forgot who wrote it, because I, I don't come in here with notes... In well, anticipation no, you don't of know questions. these questions, so how could you? Right, right. So, so there's a science fiction story where the aliens came upon Earth mm-hmm. and saw that we there's like muscle tissue, and right. and they go back to their home planet and says they're made of meat <laughs> 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 because the aliens they're made of some spirit energy, right? Right, and we're made of meat, right? And another thing that we take for granted, but I can imagine an alien uh, life form that would just freak out. Mm-hmm. Other than salt, other than salt, animals have to kill to consume food. Okay. Other than the consumption of salt. Everything else you eat was once alive. Okay? Right. Well, sorry, was- sorry, sorry. Unless you live off of milk and honey, right? Th- those themselves well, were not still once an alive. Animal, animal it's, a, it's an animal byproduct. You have to kill something. Right. And even the vegetarians even the vegetarian was are alive. slaughtering carrots. That's right. All right? Yeah. And slicing them, dicing them up, and shredding them. Yes. So the fact that we have to kill other life forms on our own planet for our own sustenance could easily be seen as one of the most barbaric things to another civilization where they all absorb energy from their host star. Right. Yes. There you have it. Because they're absorbing and not consuming. Well, they're, and, and, or, and, they're, and they have an unlimited, they're not ingesting. In, they're an unlimited source of energy from their sun, uh, just like planets, but plants on Earth. Right. They don't have to eat anything. And there's some that do, of course, but most don't. The Venus flytrap is carnivorous. And yeah. what's the other one that eats flies that a picture, smells like? A picture plant. So that one, okay, so they're carnivorous. But I all the rest picture plant, are yeah. doing just fine with sunlight. Yeah. And that's, uh, that's an awesome way to live, I think. 
If I were to evolve the human into a, another form, I'd involve us with solar panels on our skin. Nice. Yeah. Our skin would be one big solar panel. Yeah, and that way you're getting sunburned, you just recharge your, your energetics. Yes. Yeah. I believe they call that Africans. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> last I heard, those, yeah. that's why they're black. Yep. I say yep. they. <laughs> <laughs> I just said that's why they're black. <laughs> oh, that's so crazy. All right. Megan Morrissey says, hi, I'm showing for the first time an episode of Cosmos in my high school earth sciences class. Give it up for the teachers of the world. There you go. Mm -hmm. One of my students just asked me if a ship that is designed like a ship of imagination would actually be able to fly into space. Would that be possible love your show and thank you i'm not authorized to say whether i actually own one of these <laughs> <laughs> uh no the the ship of the imagination on purpose has mobility through space and time and that mobility is empowered by my thoughts whoa so there are no controls there's no uh, plus we had a mini discussion with uh, with andrewian who specified in the script that the ship would be impossibly minimalist right so i would not be wearing a badge right. which would imply that i'm captain and you're not right because you should be able to fly this as well okay. so so the ship no it, it exists completely in my imagination as your tour guide gotcha. so no there is no attempt to try to make it real there you go as there have been with the starship enterprise and Absolutely. other sort of sci-fi creations so anyway so yeah it's not uh, it's not real or it can even be imagined to be real right because it exists in my mind Nice. As your private tour guide. There you go. Yeah. There you go. Well, uh, we, 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 uh, you know what time it is. Uh-oh. It is. <laughs> I'm so bad at hitting this bell. Let me tell you. Damn. There we go. Lightning Damn, round. Lightning round. Okay. Oh, my God. We got a lightning round. Okay. okay. So I'm answering in sound bites because you still have so many I didn't get to. Okay? That's right. Ready, go. Okay, here we mm -hmm. go. Um, Jehovah Barrera wants to know, as the sun expands and gets close to the earth, Will the what will happen to the Earth besides getting really hot? Oh, so the well, well, uh, the the story here is that it's getting hot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's the story. Right. All right. So the gravity will be the same. It will still orbit the sun in the same amount of time, but it's, as it gets hot, the oceans will come to a rolling boil and evaporate into the atmosphere. The upper atmosphere will itself evaporate into space right. as we become engulfed by the expanding sun and we become a vaporized ember orbiting deep within Earth's surface. Boom. Have a nice day. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> From Andrew Lounsbury, who says, this is not relevant to science, but where did Neil get his celestial vest? Oh, actually, I own about six vests. Okay. And they're for different stages of how wide my belly is <laughs> at different times. <laughs> but the one I'm most, the mo the one I'm most seen in, I, it was the last vest sold at the gift shop of the Hanson Planetarium in Utah. Oh. In Salt Lake City, Utah, before okay. that closed and reopened in another identity. And, in fact, they had no more left, and I bought it off the back of the salesperson. And I've yet to see anyone else wearing this vest ever again. Dad. So, yeah, that's the one. That that person is probably so pissed off Took right it off now. their back. Like, but they agreed. I didn't take, I didn't steal it off their man, back. Man, give me the vest. <laughs> <laughs> you know who I am? <laughs> I'm NDT, bitch. No. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Next. Hey, next. We're in lightning round. Next. Okay. Uh, Marquello y Sueldo. Thank you. Says, uh, Mars Pioneers will be the first true 100% renewable. Will the Mars Pioneers be the first true 100% renewable energy human community ever? Uh, that's, the, that's the plan. The Mars One plan is yes. 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 That's the plan. That is the okay? plan. Initially, they'll get supplies, you know, supply chain from Earth, but ultimately, they start making the stuff themselves. Go. Thank you, Marta Cuello from Argentina. Next. All right. Adam Helch. Oh, you son of a gun. Halvaka says, hello, I'm writing from Slovakia, and me and my friends would like to know what does Neil think about pirating, i.e. illegally downloading or torrenting the show Cosmos. <laughs> okay. <laughs> What do I think of it? Because yeah, clearly they're doing that. <laughs> Appar apparently. <laughs> Get his IP address right now. <laughs> um, oh. I don't know how much control there is over that. And my guess is more people 
pirate it, then who would ever even buy it in the first place? Right. So that the exposure is greater than it would otherwise be. Um, I, you know, if everyone pirated, there'd be no money to actually produce the product. Right. So what I would say is for people who are pirating, if you're doing so, let it be because you actually can't afford it. Right. Right. And and, and then there's a way, I'd rather you knew this than you didn't. Right. But the minute you have cash flow, then, you know, pay that forward. Right, do, do, because, right. You know. Now you're screwing it up for everybody. <laughs> yeah, so See, I, I don't want, you know, I can't endorse illegal behavior, but um, if you can't afford it and you want to learn, it's like Abby Hoffman wrote a book called Steal This Book. Right. Steal that book right. that he wrote, right. which is a way, if you were without means, to try to, uh, you know, sort of exploit the system. There you go. Until you didn't have to. So, yeah, no, I, I don't, if someone told me they pirated it, and then they came and they uh, came to one of my lectures and and bought something else later on. That, that, well, fine, it's an investment. Okay, <laughs> there you go. So right. the answer is go ahead and steal. No, it's <laughs> not the answer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, um, no, that was not a soundbite answer. I'm supposed to give a soundbite answer. Uh, I give one more and we'll soundbite that and we're done. Okay, so we're way over. Okay, okay right, here we go. One more. Go. Here we go. Uh, with iron and low gravity, would Mars be an ideal place to build larger interstellar rocket ships and space stations? Yes. If you if you build a ship and you can launch from a low gravity place, that's what you want to do. Because half of your launch energy leaving Earth is just to get the hell off of Earth into orbit. Right. And the other half of your energy can take you practically anywhere else in the universe. It's certainly in the solar system. So... So, yes, launch from the lightest place you possibly can. And you know what that is? It might be empty space itself. Woo! There you go. Chuck, we're out of time. Yes. That was a uh, potpourri edition of Star Talk Cosmic Query. Yes, it was. All right, Chuck, I'll look for you on TV, on True TV. Yes. And you. you'll always make me laugh. Thanks for being a part of the Star Talk it's family. A, it's a pleasure. Uh, you've been listening to Star Talk Radio. Neil deGrasse Tyson here, your personal astrophysicist. And I have always, I bid you to keep looking. Science like Galileo dropped the orange. <laughs>